was from my own son because he had so much. He didn't have nothing to give. What I get from these kids was how to be a, a loving person, that, uh, you know, the hug and all this kind of stuff. It was hard to explain to him because he hadn't been in this situation. And uh, he was right. I probably should have spent more time with him. But here again, you think they got so much. You have all the money in the world. It won't do you damn very good unless you got somebody to share it with. You have all the love in the world. And it won't do any good. Here's that word again. I'm finally using how to. I'm finally learning how to use it. It took me 50 some years to learn how to use it. I even say the word. But it, unless you got somebody to share it with, what good is it? But uh, like I say, uh, I, I'm a rich man. Not in money, but in uh, the friends that I've made over the years. That's more important than money. I, I was offered jobs in the area office for promotions. I could have made a lot more money in Portland, but I couldn't leave my kids. The money wasn't that important. You know, it's just what, it was, money didn't mean that much to me. If I had, I had enough to live, but I couldn't leave my kids, the relationships because maybe I was selfish. I was trying to get too much from him too, you know. But uh, it worked out, it worked out. I got, I got, uh, I guess uh, my kids come back that I had 45 years ago in the dorms. They're coming back with their kids. They go up to see the old dorms, you know, dorms are gone, and they just cry. That's what it meant to them. You don't realize how much it means to them until you leave. To them, at, when they're younger, those dorms were where they lived. Forty years later, when they came back, my house has been torn down. And it just made them sob. They just cried. I seen. Seven-year-old men come back and cried when they started talking about the, the old school. That, that's how it affects you. And you don't realize it. These kids don't realize it right now. These kids are leaving. It's going to hit them maybe in a year or two. In a year or two, it's going to hit them. Next school year, and I'll be getting on the bus or whatever to come to Shimon. That's when it's going to hit him. It's over with. You know. But what can I say? For the graduates, not only here at Shimawa, but uh, the ones that may be watching, or maybe a young person is watching, or maybe a young man or a young woman is watching what would what would you want to share with them just to keep keep going the best thing I could the main thing is number one if you're going to self pity get rid of it Self-pity is a disease, just like being an alcoholic. I had it for 50 years, I'm still fighting it. I gotta fight it every day. So if you, if you think you, you gotta get past that, build yourself up, get some self-esteem. But the main thing I gotta, like I used to try to tell the kids, Self-pity, low self-esteem, leads to what? Drinking and drugs leads to what? Death. 
get past it. They do it now. Quit feeling sorry for you, Dan, so maybe you come from a bad home life. Maybe mommy and daddy don't love me. You know? Get past it. That's gonna drag you down. There's only one person that can make you happy. And that's you. You're the only one that can make yourself happy. You can go this way or you can go this way. But before you can be happy, before you can expect someone else to respect you or to love you, you gotta respect and love yourself. If you don't respect and love yourself, nobody else is gonna do it. And nobody else is gonna do it for you. You ain't gotta get out get off your dead ass and do it for yourself. Don't be a blanket ass the rest of your life. Excuse my language. If you want something, earn it. If you want respect, earn it. It's all up to you. Unfortunately, I didn't have somebody, and I'm not bragging. I wish I could have had somebody like me that would have came and said, I care about you. For the first 21 years of my life, I had no, I never had a hug in my life. After my mother died when I was three years old. I never had a hug again in my whole life until I was 21 years old. Now, that's a crutch. That's what old, that's what old Don used for a crutch. Mr. Ernstrom, did you remember Mr. Ernstrom, uh, the social worker? We had many hot discussions on the way she was talking to you kids. It goes back to what I said. She was using a white man's psychology book, which does not apply to Fred the Reservation Boy. It's a whole different world. She was giving crutches to my kids. Now, what's a crutch? Oh, they come from a bad home life. Oh, their mommy and daddy don't love them. Crutches. And people with low self-esteem and self-pity like me, they eat that up. You're fueling the fire. You're feeling the fire. I said, knock it off. Leave my kids alone. Don't talk to them. Send it to me. As soon as that kid walks in with a problem, I said, first thing I say is, here's what I went through. Now what's your problem? They find out they didn't have a problem. <laughs> but the main thing, boys and girls is if you're in that self-pity mode get out of it and get out of it fast don't be an idiot like me that took 50 years to get over it because once you get into that it becomes a comfort zone it's just like drugs and alcohol it starts to feel good and it's, and it's hard to get out of I gotta fight it every day but it cost me a lot of problems in my, uh, my relationship with my, with my family, my children. I should have never been a father. I was a terrible father. People don't believe it because of the kids. But at home, it's a whole different story. I was back into a structured situation where I was bringing my problems home and my kids had to pay for it because of my self-pity. So if you got self-pity and you
You can't get rid don't ever get married. <laughs> don't make children and wife go through what, what my children and wife had to, uh, and all the other Indian people who, who've been divorced. And, and like I say, we got the highest rate of suicide. And there's a reason for it. I've been there. I've been that close to commit suicide. It's a deep, dark hole. And if somebody would have, but the reason why I didn't do it is because I was a coward. I couldn't do it myself. <laughs> if somebody would come up with a gun and say, I might shoot you, I would have grabbed his hand and said, do it. That's how, that's how low I was. And there's a reason why you get there. Sitting around with poor little me, as in my poor little me syndrome. You gotta get out of it. Get out of it now. Mommy and daddy may be bad to you, but that's a crutch. Follow me? Mommy and daddy may be the cause of you being sad. Like I said, you're the only one that can make yourself, they can't make you happy. Your parents can't make you happy. They may give you money and make you happy for a few minutes, but that's a whole different thing. You see what I mean? They may give you a new pair of shoes and then all of a sudden I'm happy for a few minutes. But what happens when the shoes wear out? And mommy and daddy aren't there to buy you a new pair. Poor little me, mommy and daddy in here and I got no shoes. Now you're unhappy. You follow what I'm trying to say here? So they can't make you happy. The other thing I'd suggest is this. Don't ever, I don't care if it's your parents, your preacher, your teacher, whoever. Don't let anybody dictate to you how you're gonna live. Follow me? You decide. This is what I want. This is what I want to do with my life. And then with everybody else. If you do what they want you to do, you're going to be very unhappy. Like I said, they can't make you happy. They can make you unhappy. If you buy into what they're trying to sell you. My biggest problem with my kids here was <coughs> I had a boy. He had a lot of problems. Mother was an alcoholic, lived with grandpa and grandma and they and whoever took him in. And we had an excellent horse program here and he was, he came to our program. It took me about six months before to bring him out. This is how, excuse my language, how stupid the counselor was and my partner. We had to get permission to take him off campus to uh, horse sales and stuff. So they brought him down and the two idiots left the door open. He was sitting outside the door. He was doing good. He took over the horse program. I brought him out of his shell after. Within 15 minutes, he was gone like that. They had the speaker fold on and all I could hear was his drunken mother saying, he was a thief, he ain't no damn good, etc., etc., etc. And he heard this. And he bought into it. I said before, he bought into it, so he let her drag him back down. And my partner says, you gotta go talk to him. I said, no, I'll give him a week. You don't talk to a drunk, you don't talk to people that are mad. Remember what I told you that time? Stay away from them, let them come down, then talk. But it, I went back to it's just like I told him, told you. I 
So poor little Wesley, he heard his mother run him down. He and mommy call him bad names. And poor Wesley sent here feeling sorry for himself because he and mommy called him bad names. I said, get over it. You can't let her bring you back down again. That's what I'm trying to tell young people. Don't let anybody bring you down. I always tell them to go to the mirror. Every morning you get out of bed, you go to your mirror, you look straight in the mirror and you say, I'm somebody. Don't just say it, mean it. Every day, I'm somebody. And don't let anybody else ever tell you you're not. Because if you do, don't blame them, blame yourself. 95% of the problems that we have in our life, we bring on ourselves. Think about it. I'm an old man and I'm a little back. I had 95% of the problems I had was because of my low self-esteem, my stupidity, and my super temper. My fault, right? But it took me years to admit it. And once I admit it, now I feel good about myself. I don't care what my wife thinks about me. I don't care what my kids think about me. A lot of times they hold grudges. Twenty years ago, remember you did this and this and this? Well, I and trying to change. I'm working on my temper. I'm work, working on my self-pity. But you don't do it for your wife. You kids don't do it for your parents. You do it for yourself. You do it for yourself. I did it for myself. And, and when somebody says something, I tell them, you should be, I'd argue with them. I say, you're not going to ruin my day. You can't ruin my day. I'm not going to let you. You, should, you follow me? The only one that can ruin your day is you. The only one that can ruin you down is you. They're doing them. They're using the mouth, but you're the one that are letting them in. You're the you're the one that's letting them in. You're not gonna ruin my day. And walk away. Who's the winner? Who's the winner here? If you want to be a loser, go ahead and be a loser, but don't blame anybody else but yourself. Sure, I went to boarding school. I got the hell beat out of me when I'm six years old. Sure, I lost my mother when I was three years old. Sure, I had an ugly stepmother. But you know what? When I look back on it, I'm the one that's at fault because I waited for 50 years to get past. I could have done it when I was 25, or when I left to win the service. But it felt so good to be in that self-pity mood. It's hard to get out of because it's addictive. You see what I mean? So you young people, get out of it and get out of it fast. Because it's gonna ruin your whole life. You think drugs and alcohol are bad. You get drunk, you pass out, you're not gonna remember anything for a day or so. self pities with you every minute, every day, every hour. It's with you all the time. There's no break unless you break it. You better do it fast. 
That's about it. That's about it. I think that's about it. And the last thing I'll tell you, I don't care how old you are. I was asked the other day by a professor, college educated professor, asking me, I barely got out of high school for advice. I knew why. He asked me. Because he didn't have any common sense. <laughs> and the, the hardest thing to teach is somebody who's got a college degree. They send you to college, you give you a degree, knock your common sense out. So he uses me as a soundboard. The question was, if you had to give me one advice, what would it be? I said, you got to be willing to change. Think about it. Every day, things change. Every day of your life, things change. And if you don't change with them, you can grow stagnant and you're going to be sitting in a living room feeling sorry for your damn self. You've got to change along with the system. No matter what it is, no matter how old you are, you got to be able to change with the system. Grow. It's not the only change is growing with the system. No matter how old you are, I'm still growing because I'm learning from my grandkids who can run computers. I'm still using a pencil. But they're learning at an early age and hopefully they'll keep on learning. They'll keep changing every for the rest of your life. You gotta be able to change. Unfortunately, this is why we got so many suicides and so many alcoholics. Because like me, they weren't willing to change. And look where they are now. I mean, many of them are dead and in prison, whatever. You gotta be able to change to, to grow. That's part of growing. I don't care if you're 90 years old, you're still growing up here. You're gonna lose a lot of it. <laughs> but you young people, change. Don't ever forget. Change. Two things I'm gonna leave with you. Get over to self-pity and remember to change or you'll be stagnant the rest of your life. That's it. Friend and party. So good to talk with you. Thank you. I gotta admit it, if it weren't for me, you'd be nothing.